To get me started, I'd like to introduce you to our dynamic duo. Laura Walker is the Talent Development Specialist at Hemsley Fraser, and Annie Kohler is the Learning and Development Program Manager. I'm really excited to learn more about psychological safety and why it matters. So Laura, Annie, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Great, thanks, Amanda. I'll get to sharing my screen and then we can get cracking. So thank you for that great tee up. I'm looking forward to a, a really participative session today. So as we've just talked about, we're going to talk about teams particularly and how they fit in the organization in relation to learning together um, and psychological safety in the context of learning within teams. Um, we've got lots of practical suggestions and ideas to share with you, but also some really evidence-based insight. And that's where we're going to start uh, with our session. We are going to be participative. So for those of you who know Hensley Fraser know that we like to be very engaging in all of our learning. So there will be plenty of opportunities for you to engage, participate, and to embed that learning that as you go through the session today. It will be really helpful if you have a mobile device known as generally a phone, handy for you to log on because we are going to be using Mentimeter for some of our polls and quizzes today. So if you have a moment, it might be worth grabbing one if you haven't already. I think probably 90 odd percent of the audience will already have one handy. So I'm confident of that today. OK, so if you can grab that and then you'll be ready in a moment. As we just heard from Amanda, I'm here today with Annie and we're just going to take a moment to introduce ourselves. Um, not a big fan of long introductions, so I'll keep it um, short and sweet. Um, as you just heard, I'm a specialist in talent development. Um, I'm actually an associate uh, consultant with Hemsley Fraser. I've been working with the organization about 15, 16 months now, and I focus primarily on the insight and also uh, working with clients around particularly senior leadership teams. Uh, I've worked in six different industries, large names that you'll have heard of before, usually heading up L&D talent or organization effectiveness or a combination of all of those things. Welcome, Annie. Thank you, Laura. And again, I'm Annie Kohler. I am a program manager with Hemsley Fraser. Uh, my educational background is in psychology, and I offer a diversity and inclusion certification. And before coming to Hemsley Fraser about a year and a half ago, I have 10 years worth of workforce development experience. So it's very exciting to be here with you today. I look forward to a great conversation. Okay, so just briefly, quickly, who are we? Who is Hemsley Fraser? Uh, so we've been in the learning space for over 30 years, and we are a global leader in learning, people development, and engagement. We have headquarters in the United States, the US, and Germany, and we offer turnkey learning solutions. Uh, we're a global delivery partner. We've operated in over 90 countries and we have an award-winning design house. We're industry-leading digital platform provider. And very excitingly, we are consistently ranked as one of the top 20 leadership and top 20 training outsource firms in the world. And this has been consistently for each year of the last 10. But most of all, we love learning and the transformative effect that it can have on individuals, teams, and your entire workforce. And our variety of awards shows really that we offer it all, content, platform, services, the full suite. And back to you, Lauren. Thank you. So now you know a little bit about who we are and what we do. It's time to hear from, from you. So we're going straight over to our first poll. So if you can log into menti.com on your device, which should only just take a moment, but it's, it's pretty quick. You will see a poll uh, emerge in a second. And we're just gonna inquire about how likely are you to speak up? And we mean speak up, join in, participate in today's session because obviously we're talking about psychological safety and speaking up is all of, all about that or it's, it's certainly um, a requirement that you feel safe in order to speak up so it's a very relevant topic for today so we're going to go over to our poll now with our invisible sam who is here helping us in the background 
Yeah. Okay, so we're already getting some responses in here. We've got a good group here, I can tell, Annie. Highly positive. I agree. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. We'll give you a moment for those of you who are catching up. So I can see a question pop up. The, the code is at the, at the top of the slide. So the code is right there. There you go. <laughs> so it's Excellent. the ACP code. And each time we go to Mentimeter, so you might want to keep it handy, um, we'll have a different code. So you'll need to just punch in a code, but it will be in the same place. Very easy. OK, well, let's pause there. But I can see, like I say, we've got a, a participative group. So there's lots of people who are wondering. So maybe they'll get involved, which I think is fair enough because we're right at the foothills of our session. Agreed. Um, we've also got people who are keen to get involved in lots of ways, uh, in whatever way you can. And that's the beauty of today's session. There will be different ways. So if you feel safe, then obviously you can get involved in a whole variety of different uh, sections as we go through. Okay, thanks Sam. Okay, going back in then. <clears throat> so let's dive into the topic. Um, before we go any further, I think it's usually helpful to be clear about what we mean by psychological safety. And the leading researcher, as many of you will probably know in this space, is Amy Edmondson, who's been studying psychological safety as a researcher, particularly around um, Harvard Business School, for over 30 years. And this is her definition, and this is we agree that this is a really helpful definition. So psychological safety is the belief that one will not be public, public, punished excuse me, or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, a mistake, and that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. So several elements in there, but essentially it being about speaking up, but also about interpersonal risk-taking. Risk There's also a lot of evidence that shows that it makes a real difference to teams and to individuals, but certainly around team performance. There's, big project, which I'm sure many of you will know about, called Project Aristotle, which was run with Amy at Google. And they looked at the most high-performing teams and what made the difference. And all of these factors came out as key uh, foundational elements. So if psychological safety was in place, they saw improvements around speaking up, around sharing of mistakes, higher engagement, higher inclusion and belonging all the things that you can see here. So it's a key foundational element. And we know, and, and probably many of you know too, it really does make a difference to organizations and teams tangibly, as well as that felt, felt sense. The other thing that's interesting is the spike and the surge that we've seen in the interest in the topic. So as you can see, it was always interesting uh, for people, but it's certainly taken off in the last few years. And we've seen an exponential uh, growth in mentions, certainly in, in social media and popular media of the topic and searches, for example, people interested in this topic. You could say it's down to increased uncertainty that we've experienced over the last two, three, four years. And obviously lots of um, factors around globalization and um, automation and different changes to the way we work um, as well. Hybrid obviously has become more relevant in the last few years. Virtual working has thrown up some new challenges um, that are relevant in the space of teams working together. Now teams is not a new concept for learning. So teams has always been a concept for learning and even more relevant as we've just talked about. So as teams are working in new and different ways, we're having to navigate new ways of creating that safe environment where teams can perform and thrive um, together. So from a team perspective, learning is a very natural phenomenon within teams. So as human beings, we're naturally social learners. So from birth, we learn from other people. So we learn from other people's successes, from other people's mistakes. We learn from guidance 
uh, from other people. So social learning has also seen an increase in the last few years, but it's always been there uh, to some extent. It's a very natural uh, part of being in a team. It's also a very necessary part of being in a team. And what we've seen with more agile development around teams, so as teams becoming more agile, they've necessarily had to be better at learning in the flow of their work. So learning has had to become a natural part of how we work together and how we innovate, how we're creative, how we tackle complex challenges that we've never seen before. We can't learn in theory, we have to learn in the moment. So it's become much more necessary. Teams themselves, we'll touch on in a minute, have become much more dynamic. So teams have been forming and reforming in different ways. We're often members of, of many different teams at the same time, um, and certainly play a different role potentially in a number of different teams. So if certainly when I was um, in organizations, I was a member of my own team. So, and also a member of leadership teams, a member of various communities, professional bodies, and so on. So many of many teams all at the same time. The other thing is that being in a team is not without interpersonal risk. So risk around psychological safety. So if we're learning and having to do things that we're not doing before, we're stretching our comfort zones, we're having to do something new. And by definition, that takes a degree of courage and bravery to step out of the comfort zone and to stretch into those, those new things. And there is a saying that if there is no fear, there is no need for courage. So if we can actually create a safety, there is less need to feel brave to, to step out and to do something else because actually it's, it's still a need, but it could be potentially less of a need because we feel safer. Okay, so I did tell you that we are going to be going back to uh, menti.com because we're really keen to have your participation as long as you feel willing to do so during the day. And, and quite a lot of you did say you were. And um, so our next uh, section is a poll, basically, or to see how many teams that you're in. So we're going to go back to uh, Mentimeter now. Okay, brilliant. So lots of people already in there putting which teams they apply or they're part of. Nice variety of different teams people could be a part of as well, including sports, being involved in your community, your functional teams, client focusing, leadership. Fantastic. So I think this is a really good illustration that we're probably all members of lots of different types of teams, um, often at the same time. So that's the, the notion of teaming is becoming more relevant. So I don't know if you, if you have heard of that phrase. It's the idea that we're forming and reforming teams all the time. It's more of a verb than a thing. Yes. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right, and thank you, Laura. So our Hemsley Fraser Insight Group brought together evidence and best practices to develop a speak framework that we're going to be presenting here today. And this is a framework that is relevant across sectors and is designed to provide guidance for three main populations. We have team leaders, learning designers, and learning facilitators. Uh, for team leaders, this will support those who are striving for clarity of expectations and standards, seeing value in inclusive decision making, pulling in multiple challenging points of view, and even what we might call constructive contention. Looks like we're in between two slides, uh, but that is okay. I'm going to continue along. Um, and this is also designed to support 
learning designers, um, those who can build psychological safety right into team practices, uh, right into their program's design. Um, the program design, of course, should be human-centered first and foremost, augmented with technology, but always catering to those with various learning styles and those of groups from all over the world. Okay, thank you very much for this next slide. Okay, so the SPEAK framework, very excited to be launching this today for everyone. This guides us in creating and fostering a climate that nurtures team learning. And it highlights five distinct priorities to boost psychological safety in teams. So first, um, it is a very nice and easy acronym to remember. And we are gonna take a deep dive into each of these. But just to get started first, we set the scene to inspire high standards. Next, locate ourselves in place, knowing that each and every team member belongs in the group, that they bring value and they are included. And this includes physical environment. And then we engage, knowing that each team member is going to come to the work, come to the learning from their own point of view and engage in their unique way that should be celebrated. And then my favorite, Activate, this is where we have the opportunity to role model behavior that builds psychological safety in our teams, challenging, responding, being okay with failure, and asking and encouraging, and also checking in with people. And then lastly, knowing that not one person will have all of the answers and that we will also look to measure what matters so that we know that we are adding value and that we are staying in tune with our team. Okay, so we're getting the slide deck. There we go. Thank you, Laura. Apologies. And I, yes, I'm back. <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. And I'm going to pass it right over to you to kick us off with set the scene. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, next slide. Okay, thank you. Got it. Um, so we're now going to do a deep dive into each of the five elements of the SPEAK framework. So the first and probably the place to start really for most leaders um, or people who are leading learning teams specifically. We bring teams together for the purpose of learning all the time. We have often seen many examples of this. So if we're designing learning um, or, or leading a team. So in terms of um, setting the scene, as adults, we learn best when we really understand the relevance of what we're learning. So being ready, willing and committed to what it is that we're doing um, whether it's learning within the process of a team or whether it's specifically within a learning program um, or whatever it happens to be. A key thing around um, setting the scene from a psychological safety point of view is making it okay to disrupt the status quo. So as human beings, we have a natural bias towards the status quo. We need to maintain balance in our lives and that generally means the status quo. So we have to retrain our brain or even go against our natural instincts to challenge the status quo and to speak up often in a social setting. And also having high standards and creating sufficient stretch for the team is also really important from a uh, psychological safety point of view. So safe doesn't necessarily mean comfortable. So it's important to know it is about create caring enough to create high standards for individuals, but also for the team as a whole, but also the support that goes with that. Part of that obviously is around encouraging mistakes and destigmatizing failure. So we're going to invite you as a little bit of interactivity to go into the chat. So we're just on Zoom this time. So just in the Zoom chat, just please share a top tip that you would have and we'll obviously can keep this so you can um, do this at your leisure but just what's the first top tip that occurs to you about encouraging mistakes and destigmatizing failure what sort of things have you tried or have you seen other people try successfully 
it'd be great to hear from you. Give you a moment and then we'll move on. Sharing your own mistakes and lessons learned. One of my favorites. I make them all the time. <laughs> Blameless reviews. Excellent. I can see the number of ideas shooting up. This is great. I can't wait to read these. I'm going to still with, still with glee, I think. Spinning failures into learning opportunities. Absolutely. Yes, showing our vulnerability. Absolutely. Coming to something with curiosity that we might not have all the answers. No one person does. Okay. Mistakes, yes, help us learn more than being successful. How true. Very true. Yes. The goal is not perfection. Wouldn't it be interesting if we were all perfect? What a world would that be? <laughs> yeah, it's quite liberating, isn't it, to not have to be? You know, to just know I'm a work in progress. Like, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Some great ideas. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Love all the ideas that came through chat. Exploring mistakes, lean into them. Excellent. So we've set the scene. And next, we're going to locate ourselves in place. And this really is a critical factor of, of fostering, nurturing, and building psychological safety in your team making sure that each team member knows that they belong where they are. They are an accepted and valued member of the team. They are valued and what they bring is valuable. It is also interesting because we have to look at the physical environment. We are very much working in a different type of workspace these days with hybrid working coming around uh, and being so prevalent. It's important that we get curious about our teammates and see where they thrive the best. For example, where someone might really work well in a quiet environment that might be very off-putting for someone else and vice versa. Whenever I'm reading, I'm right into it or if I'm studying or I'm talking with someone, if there's music playing, I'm ready to dance. I'm gonna go be distracted. So really lean into what, how that you can best support each team member with their physical environment. Um, and it really just making safe in their particular context. All right. And we're going to go to another Menti quiz. So Sam, our invisible Sam, as we called you earlier <laughs> in the background, helping us out. We're going to try another quiz. All right. You'll see the code right at the top. I'll just give a, a few moments just to make sure that everyone does join before I start the quiz. Don't want to uh, miss anybody out. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. There you are. We love hearing your voice. <laughs> okay, I'll just give a few more seconds. Okay, I can still see people popping. There we yeah. go. Yes. 66. A couple of top hats appeared, I noticed. I can still see the number going up. Just as it stops, you think it, it goes up again. <laughs> so. You're right, Amanda. This is fun. Okay, I think we've oh no, maybe not. Okay, we'll give it five five more seconds and then I will uh, we'll we'll start the quiz. Okay, I think we might be at our max actually. Let's show it as in the physical. Uh, images that we can see, not the number of people. But. Okay, so I will now start the quiz. So 
So what difference do inclusive managers make to job satisfaction? Is it 1.4 times higher, 2.4 times higher, or 3.4 times higher? Excellent. The impact that inclusive managers make on job satisfaction, 3.4 times higher. This is a very strong aspect of engagement as well. Job satisfaction, turnover, the number one people, the reason people leave their jobs is their manager. And when you have someone who is leaning into you, recognizing your value, seeing exactly where you fit in the team, what uniqueness that you bring that is going to help us come to the innovative solutions that our clients are looking for, the happier we are and the longer we stay in jobs. So excellent work. Absolutely make a huge difference when people have an inclusive manager. All right, question two of three. What percentage of people report poor mental health when they don't have access to the same opportunities and privileges as others? Absolutely. Whenever we do not have opportunity or privilege, it has devastating effects on our mental health. And that can translate into when non-inclusive behavior in the workplace can affect us never, very negatively, can lead to absenteeism, not really showing up to give your best, not feeling valued. And whenever we don't have the same opportunities, we may want to look elsewhere as well. Um, I, so many companies across the globe are putting an emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, knowing that the mental health outcomes are poor for those who face discrimination and do not have the same privileges as others. So yes, um, it's we're actually looking at a very high number. Okay, question three of three. Workers in an inclusive team are X more likely to report their workplace as safe and supportive for poor mental health compared to non-inclusive teams. Very good. So when you have an inclusive team that's safe and supportive, we are going to feel better when we work. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Oops. Okay. Great, thank you. So that was the P of place. Let's move on to our first um, E, so around um, engage. So we've got two key aspects that are relevant to engage. So the first is around helping people to connect and feel connected with the work, the program, whatever it is that's going on, and recognizing that people connect and feel engaged in different ways. So we might connect to a, a task or a program or a piece of work um, differently. So it's about inviting team members to make sense of what matters to them and how that sh uh, shows up in the context of what it is that you're working on or the learning program that they're involved with. The second aspect, it relates to the learning itself. So people might feel engaged, but how can you make the, the learning experience, whether that's an everyday learning experience or a learning product or service, and learning really needs to be engaging by design. So the way we talk about that um, within Hemsey Fraser, we have our four E's framework and we literally design learning to excite, engage, embed and evolve. 
So all learning needs to excite a learner. So, you know, how much better is it when you really are quite enticed um, by the learning? If you're involved in it, if you then have the opportunity to practice it and to apply that learning quickly and then evolve it as it goes. OK, so two key aspects to engage. We're heading back to menti.com um, again uh, from not quite the last time, but getting there. Um, so if we can open that up again, Sam, thank you. So a few people are already in there. See, so you've got it nailed now. I, yes. I'm impressed by this group, definitely. <laughs> so we talked about learning by design, but what are the key barriers to learning in your organization? So pop, things are popping up here. And we actually did, um, we do an annual survey of L&D trends as an organization. And these are the key things that came up in that survey. <clears throat> so it'd be interesting to see what your organization's experience is of them. Yes, time and resource topping the charts. Absolutely. Also that importance of having a learning culture, which yeah. psychological safety will build. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Some practical challenges around digital literacy, budgets and costs and so on. Um, obviously, technology has become a much bigger feature in learning over the last few years. It's been massively accelerated. But yeah, still awesome. getting a few responses in. Buy-in and resistance, uh, again, tied to learning culture. And that really can come from the top down. You know, having watched, the, we look to our leaders uh, to set the tone for time spent and buy-in and uh, resistance to making the space for learning. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Activate, one of my favorites. This is where we get to jump in and role model psychologically safe behavior. I love this here. It is not a spectator sport. We are in this. We are here to put our ideas out there, to invite people, ask questions. Um, again, like it came up earlier, share the stories of times we've failed. Show that you know, we are not perfect. What did we learn from the stories that we had and definitely be open to change. It's we're constantly evolving. Our workforce has changed so much, but to kindly push for new ideas, be challenging in a supportive way and understand that a little structure can go a long way. Set aside structured times with your with your teams to check in, see what's working, see what's not, plan and innovate but do it together. That is going to build that psychologically safe space. And also, you know, recognize and appreciate those who speak up. That's encouraging what we're going for. But I would say most of all, really recognize that person who maybe is speaking up for the first time. They are stepping outside of their comfort zone and the psychologically safe environment that you've been building and fostering is working. So when that person speaks up, ensure they have the floor. And also in activating and role modeling our own behaviors, be very mindful of your reaction to bad news or mistakes. The wrong reaction can bring down all of the hard work that we put into building a psychologically safe space if it comes from a place of authoritarian and um, a negative reaction to those mistakes that some companies right now are celebrating because there is so much to learn. Uh, it is also very important to have clear expectations. I love that. I don't make mistakes. I make learning experiences. Cindy, thank you. That is excellent. And then you know, addressing that non-inclusive behavior, if it creeps back into the learning space or the work, uh, it should be crystal clear that that is not, this is not the space for that. Uh, we have strong boundaries and directly address non-inclusive behavior as it happens, because we all belong here. It goes back to place, 
you're valued, you're unique, and you bring something that co contributes to this group and we know our roles. So let's chat in, talking about role models. Um, who has perhaps modeled some psychologically safe behavior for you in the past? And this could be anyone from someone you've worked with in the past to perhaps a family member, someone in your community, one of my former leaders, Nancy, thank you. Your previous boss, thank you. you know, I think we've all had that individual somewhere along our career path that we look back to and say, wow, that's someone who really saw the value in me. And I felt like I could be myself and put myself out there. We have a former boss who was eye-opening, mental health, open, constructive discussion, mental health days. I love it. Tells his mistakes, being vulnerability, being vulnerable. Oh, graduate advisor and student activities. Thank you. Student coordinator, my coworker, one of my doctors. Wonderful. When I really had the opportunity to speak up, I love that. That is someone who opened up space for you to speak up and contribute. And that's wonderful. Contribute in that way. Oh, in the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion and my current and previous leaders in the company I work now. Yes, thank you. Again, we have so many people that we do not forget along the way. My daughter, Michelle, thank you. <laughs> oh, She's so that. focused, inclusion <laughs> in all things. Yes, Laura, I love that. Yeah. It could be because I'm also missing my daughter who's in Australia at the moment. Oh, oh that's a year. Far ways. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, Laura. Oh. Thank you. Um, so our final element of our speak framework, of course, is the K. And the challenge of knowing, but also not knowing. Um, and I think we touched on this a little bit in the chat. So what we mean by this is being a not knower. So as a leader, it can be quite tough to be a not knower. But then when you kind of get used to it, a lot of leaders find it liberating. Because you're not, you don't have to know everything about the subject. You can be curious, you can inquire, you can ask opinion of your team, particularly early on in a process. So if you can time it really well, well you can get some really valuable input um, and insight from colleagues or from the wider team. The other thing about knowing is really getting to know the team. So discover their stories, get to understand about their unique talents and skills and strengths and experiment with ways of making the most of those unique talents and strengths but also encourage them to get to know each other so you know you you all, when you get to know somebody's story and you can relate to them at a personal level or certainly at an individual level um, it, it makes all the difference around safety you can feel heard and seen uh, in, in a really powerful way and then the other thing about knowing is psychological safety is not a one and done it's dynamic, it's affected by a whole variety of different factors. And there are some very good, robust survey methods that you can use now to check how you're doing. So we would encourage you to regularly check in with the team, uh, whether that's in a learning program or within a work team, about how you're doing and other things that we can improve and that we can have those real conversations as a team. So there's a different elements to knowing, not knowing. So yes, knowing, but also yes, not knowing um, fundamentally. And now we're going to make our last visit to menti.com for a little quiz uh, on this particular aspect around knowing, not knowing. Keeping Sam busy today, aren't we? We are. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh, already lots of people in there. Fantastic. Excellent. We definitely got this off pan now. Yes. And as everyone comes together, I love Barrett, the monthly Better Know a Teammate contest where you uh, choose what teammate said what. This month was a favorite Muppet. I love that. I think that's such a nice way to get to know one another as people. It helps mm -hmm. us build trust amongst our teams. Perfect. Okay, we'll we'll just give it maybe 10 more seconds. Thank you. 
for people to join in. I love these little icons. So sweet. Yeah. And random too. You have no say whatsoever in what you are. <laughs> Which is quite good in a way. You... Yes. <laughs> okay, just five more seconds. No, they were slow seconds anyway. <laughs> the flirt was 66 or 67. Okay, and with that in mind, okay, we'll, we'll start the quiz. Thank you. So same again, we have three questions. Just so you're all in a familiar place. Okay, first question, what percentage of US employees strongly agree that their opinions seem to count at work? Is it 30%, 40% or 50%? Indeed, 30%. So we seem to have a good level of awareness here of the challenge that we have facing us. So obviously a big opportunity um, to listen and to engage more of the team and, and sharing their opinions and being able to speak up. So a big challenge, but one that we're aware of that could be with soon. Okay, let's have a go at question two. Okay, so we're looking for the percentage of difference. So what diverse teams make what percentage better decisions? So do they make 67%, 87% or 97% better decisions? Correct. Yes, 87%. I suspect a few of you have heard of this study um, before, which is great. So really good advice around encouraging diverse thinking in lots of different dimensions. So it can be from an inclusive point of view, but lots of different um, versions of diversity, including age diversity, of course, which is probably the least mentioned version of um, diversity. Okay, so yeah, so we're, all, we're on the page, so we know it's a problem and we know we need diverse teams. Okay, question three. The need for meaning in work increases during life, but when does it peak? So does it peak between 40 and 50? Does it peak between 50 and 60? Or is it beyond 60? Huh. Indeed, beyond 60, so actually 65. So the need for meaning is important at all stages in our lives. And we talk a lot about the meaning in work for younger generations and people looking for that more and more, and that's true. But the need for it, and if it's an unsatisfied need, it will grow. So you need to pay attention to that need, which is even more reason to pay attention to what engages our people and what do we know about them, about what um, excites and encourages their involvement in work and to bring those talents and skills with them. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our speak framework. So we're now going to open up the Q&A function, I believe, or feel free to also work in chat. Um, and just say, what are you still curious about? Or what are you most curious about? And obviously Annie and I are really happy to respond, um, but given that you guys are all so active in the chat, maybe you can also offer ideas. So when somebody um, is brave enough um, and feels they can speak up and pose a question or share an observation of something that they, they're finding a challenge within their organization. So what is it that you're curious about with this topic? And if you can put that in the Q&A, that would be fantastic. It's just easier for us to manage. Um, but also feel free to join in and speak up with your suggestions also. That'd be great. So I'm going to come off um, slide so we can actually see. Okay, fabulous. So I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you, Amanda. Man. Lovely, thank you. 
I'm training an employee in my office and I've got three mutes on and I keep forgetting to unmute. I'm so sorry, everyone. All right. Yeah. Multitasking. Very exciting. Uh, if you have final thoughts uh, or questions for Laura and Annie, go ahead and post them in the chat or in the Q&A. First, really easy one. Beverly's just wondering, where are the stats from today? Oh, well, that's a good question. They are from all sorts of different places, but um, a really good source. I mean, the age-related stats um, are from, uh, well, government studies primarily. So there are some huge government studies around that. Diverse teams similarly um, yeah, we're all over the place, um, in lots of different sources. If you go to, um, on our website, you will see later, there's a, a virtual, well, a digital copy of the report around psychological safety in teams. All the references are in that report. So if you, um, if you do have a chance to go to the website and have a look at the report, the references and the further reading is in there. Excellent. I have just uh, dropped the link in the chat as well. Yeah. Let's have a look. Thanks, Sam. Uh, all right, so let's jump in because there are a ton of questions and we've got some time. So let's see what we can get through. All right, this one came in from Marissa. She wants to know what advice would you give to a person whose boss does not promote psychological safety, whose behavior is basically the opposite of the speak model? And just to be clear, she's not talking about her current boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think for me, there is a bit of a balance. And we're not saying that you should speak up whatever. What we're saying is to be alive to interpersonal risk. Um, and if you believe, and if you remember the definition of psychological safety is the belief that you won't be humiliated or persecuted for speaking up. If that is not the case in that environment, it sounds like it's it's a, a challenge to be able to do that. One of the things we also talked about is that people are in several different contexts at the same time. So in different other different teams or maybe in their wider um, lives. So I think, you know, what you generally will find as well that your, your felt sense of psychological safety will vary from team to team. Um, so there's only so much you can do, but I think there's certain things that you could do to start to raise that conversation with the manager or the members of the team, just to just to dip your toe into, you know, practicing and experimenting with things that that can encourage um, the growth of that over time. Um, but the, the, they do need to get interested somehow. So it's how do you get them interested in something that's not a natural place? Mm -hmm. Challenge. That is challenging. Uh, all right, I love this question from uh, Brian. We, we often have conversations about this in our leadership team, but how do you show genuine interest in others without seeming like you're prying? Where is that fine line? And how do you, how do you know where, when, how, to, how to find it? No, I, would, I would look towards just always erring on the side of being appropriate, you know, being genuine, coming to something authentically, listening. First, getting information just by paying attention and observing before just asking and drilling questions. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would approach that. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think you can um, give people the option about how much they tell you. So if you can ask a broad question, so what's your story or what's your background or, um, you know, what sort of things were you involved with before you came here? People can choose how much they tell you. Um, so you're not probing too specifically. Um, and then I think you can usually get a, a pretty good guide of how much they're willing to share. Um, I, I'll be honest, I've tripped up over this one personally <laughs> before. And our, rule, our uh, laws in the UK are less strict <laughs> than in the US. So, uh, yeah, I think this would be an issue. Um, or would have been historically. So I think that certainly as a coach, I find it easier to, to go gradually and to um, give people the option to open up as much as they want to, um, but not to be too drilling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I give people the space. Uh, but of course, you know, only share what you're comfortable with. Exactly. Yes. I literally um, label it. Perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay, so I have to ask this question because like four people upvoted it in the chat. If that's if you oh. can do that thing, if that's a thing we can do. Um, but let's see, how do we actually get buy-in from the top management with respect to psychological safety implementation in workplaces? I can start and pass it yeah. over to Laura. Um, yeah. I, I would get to know your leader and see what speaks to them. And there is a very strong business case for psychological safety. If you look at the ability to allow people to bring their uniqueness to work, they are going to bring what they are passionate about and bring ideas from various points of view, which leads to innovative solutions, which lead to impacting the bottom line. So money does talk, but that's not the entire ball of wax here whatsoever. People are going to be happier, healthier in teams when they feel psychologically safe. Well-being is a very important, coming through the pandemic is critical right now. You're going to have healthier teams. People are going to want to show up. So there are so many factors that you can take to leadership to show them that this is going to benefit individuals, the team, and the organization as a whole. I think I'd, um, I'd build on that um, and perhaps be even a little bit more pragmatic um, uh, just to offer a different perspective for you um, from there. So in my experience of working in large organisations, it is very difficult to bring about a shift in the climate or the culture coherently. So I would definitely suggest you go with where the energy is mm. and then foster the fear of missing out. Ah, very Leaders nice. Leaders when someone else is getting something that they're not getting. So mm -hmm. actually go with where the energy is, prove the concept, work with it, experiment, grow the interest, and then others will follow. Mm, very yeah. nice. I okay. love it. Yeah, me too. That's a good one. Um, all right, Sandra's question. Can you speak a little bit about the connection between emotional intelligence and psychological safety? Yes, I guess we can. So, um, <laughs> well, it's just something I've never thought about before. So, mm. great question. It so is a great question. That yeah, that's a, it's an interesting one. Um, I mean, if we think about emotional intelligence, about being um, around understanding your own emotions and regulating them appropriately, um, and channeling them, um, basically, if I paraphrase the, uh, the description of emotional intelligence. Um, I mean, certainly around psychological safety as a leader and being aware of your own responses to things and having that pause and that moment where you're thinking through, how am I responding to a mistake or somebody else uh, responding inappropriately to someone else so how am I going to tackle this issue and being aware of your own reaction to it mm. um, I think is a, is a really powerful thing and the other thing um, that I think is connected with emotional intelligence is um, the two different systems of thinking so the automatic reaction thinking and the thought thinking and how you can engage your whole brain in your thinking rather than your base brain um, and I think there's a really good connection there around uh, how uh, particularly as a team leader or as a learning leader how you can use all of your brain in how you create that environment and foster that environment of psychological safety so I think it's it's partly in the the way the mindset um, but also in how you act um, Agreed, agreed. I would even reference back to when we talked about uh, activate in the speak framework, um, us being, you know, emotionally intelligent and understanding that if we react negatively to a mistake or an error, something to that effect, that we could bring down all the hard work that we had put together, if we react in an authoritarian way. So being emotionally, emotionally intelligent, taking that pause Laura spoke of and ensuring that we continue along our path of psychological safety and even celebrating that mistake. All right, we only have a few moments left, but I've got to squeeze in these last two questions because they are con constant hot topics um, relative to almost anything we present here at Training Industry Webinars. So um, Michelle says, how are people fostering safety with so many employees and teams working remotely? How do you do this from far away? 
So it is a really good question because obviously new ways of working bring different ways of interacting and how you create that um, psychologically safe environment. Um, I have actually seen some really good examples of where team leaders are fostering psychological safety in hybrid teams. Um, it takes a little bit of creativity and certainly lots of proper conversations about what people prefer. Um, but a lot of it seems to be about having really open conversations about where people do what, what type of work best. Mm -hmm. And then when you are together or when you're not together, having those appropriate um, and relevant patterns or ways of working. Um, but I think it is really about the knowing and really getting underneath what works for different people. So some people feel much more psychologically safe in a coffee shop, for example, having a conversation than they would in a quiet room. So I think just being curious about that is a really helpful place to start, but it's not unchallenging. Agreed. And, and getting to know each one um, as human beings, getting to know each other as not just someone I work with, but as a person coming to the space with so much to offer. So then when things do go sideways, we have that trust in one another. We can talk it through and we can learn from it. Mm -hmm. I love those answers. Small talk isn't there just to fill space, right? It's there so that we can connect on a human level before we do the work. I love that. Um, and then just really quickly, because this is so important, what is the metric? What is the metric or the goal that you might inspect to ensure that teams are moving towards a more psychologically safe environment? How do we know it's working? Um, well, I think as I mentioned in knowing, there are some really good tools. And again, those are in the paper that um, Sam provided the link to, some really robust questions. So seven questions or five questions that you can that you can use that you know are validated questions that you can use with your team. And obviously you can have uh, conversations and also qualitative measures as well. So you don't just have to go with the whole, um, just the pure survey. You can get some expansion and some color um, on that. Um, so absolutely uh, keep measuring <laughs> because as we said, it's not a one and done. It's a, it's a keep inquiring, keep asking. Ongoing process. Annie, Laura, thank you so very much. And Sam, shout out to the back. Hey. Um, Thanks, Sam. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful event. And, and don't worry for all of our attendees who asked questions and we didn't get to them. I have a, a very uh, deep feeling in my heart that the Hemsley Fraser team will be in touch to help you uh, answer your question. But I really appreciate you taking the time and putting so much uh, thoughtfulness into this presentation for our viewers today, Annie and Laura. Thank you so much. And thank you for stepping in when my tech failed. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so exciting. Live events. All right, everyone. You can catch us at some upcoming webinars and events, trainingindustry.com slash webinars for all of your informational needs. Of course, every event we do pre-qualifies you for credit by ISPI, SHRM, HRCI, and CPTM. What is CPTM? It's the Certified Professional and Training Management Program. If you're looking to up your personal and professional game by linking your learning initiatives to your organizational goals, this is the program for you. Check out our website for more information on how you can become involved in our next practicums. Of course, if you really want to learn online, you can join me and my host, Marissa Shapiro, for our TICE virtual happening in October 12th through 13th. Training the changing workforce is our topic. One last time, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to Laura and Annie, and of course, Sam. Thanks to Hemsley Fraser for sponsoring today's event. Thanks to all of you for attending. Until we see you back here next time, enjoy it out there.